welcome to episode eight of the Mingled Yarncast. I'm your host, Stephen, and uh, you can find me online on the socials at knitfen, at Instagram, and Ravelry. And today, we're going to be talking about a trip that I took recently to France. Uh, we'll be discussing, of course, the yarn and uh, nitty sort of things that I discovered and got into while I was there, but also, and, and things that I worked on and finished while there as well. Um, but I'm also going to share some travel images with you, and I'm going to uh, be talking a lot about the wineries that we saw because I, this was a food and wine tour that I was on. It was amazing. So pour yourself a glass of the beverage of your choice. It does not need to be alcoholic, but we will be talking a lot about wine, so if you're so inclined, go for it. Grab your knitting or your crocheting and come along. Let's chat. Um, I myself will not be partaking of the drink. However, I do have a glass of pomegranate juice that looks the part, doesn't it? You're fooled, aren't you? It's also delicious. Um, you know, stay over there. Uh, Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, he said that a writer should write drunk and edit sober. That's one of his famous dictums and bits of advice. I don't think that that's true for people who are doing videos and podcasts. Probably the opposite is true. It's probably better to film sober and edit drunk. Actually, it's probably best to do both of them sober. But in any case, that doesn't mean that you, the viewer, can't have whatever you want to drink. So you go for it. Um, where to begin? I have so much to talk about today. And um, actually, the first two things I want to talk about are recaps from the previous episode, because a lot of you um, wrote very kind messages to me about the uh, shawl that I made for Tori Amos who I saw in concert a month ago today. I can't believe that it's already a month ago. The summer is flying by. Um, but uh, I did deliver it to her tour manager. So I assume that it made it into her hands. She didn't like call me up and gush about it and tell me how much she loved it. I know, I know. But she's a busy lady and uh, she's just finishing up her tour. So who knows, maybe, maybe I'll get a little TY thank you note via Instagram, but even if I don't, it's not about that. It's not why I did it, um, <laughs> but I'm glad that it's in her hands and I hope she's enjoying it. She did actually, two days before that concert, two or three days, she broke her foot and uh, I hope she's healing well, but I, I thought to myself, you know, maybe, maybe she's recuperating on the tour bus, the AC is cold and she needs a nice little cozy shawl to wrap up in. That's the image that's in my head, so I hope that that's the case. Anyway. Thank you, Tori, for the wonderful concert. Hope you enjoyed the shawl if you're watching this. And uh, the tour was amazing. Thanks for that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you about, uh, well, in the previous episode, I talked about this shirt, which I'm going to get to later. But um, I also wanted to say something that I did recently before going to France that um, definitely worth sharing. I, put, I made a YouTube short about this, um, but it's, it's worth going into a little more depth. Um, I went to the American Folk Art Museum for the very first time uh, about a month ago. Uh, actually, yeah, it was, it was the day that I went to see Tori, so uh, it was a month ago. And um, I'm, I'm sharing this with a little bit of um, shame and guilt because, you know, I've lived in New York City for 20 years. Well, there's New York City. I live in New Jersey right now. But um, I've worked in the area. I lived and worked in the area for 20 years. And I am in the Lincoln Center area a lot because I teach theater and I take students there. I see things there. And so I'm in the, in the area a whole lot. And um, I've always walked by the American Folk Art Museum. And my feeling was always just kind of like, hmm, that's probably interesting to go see one day, but not today. And it's not until in the recent, you know, last two or three years that I've really gotten back into knitting. Um, as you know, if you've watched previous episodes, I've, I've been knitting for about 13, 14 years, 16 years, I don't know, whatever, 2006, do the math. I can't do it in my head right now while I'm talking. But in any case, um, a long time. Uh, but in the last couple of years, I've gotten much more serious about it. And um, because of that, when I had the time and I was passing by, I finally said, you know what? 
I do want to go see this. I want to see this now. Um, I think I feel a little more connected to the um, what they have to exhibit and the artwork and and um, and yet at the same time I still kind of thought that it would be oh homespun hokey. I, I was downplaying it. I was being very snobbish. I totally admit it. Um, in terms of how I was anticipating my reaction to the artwork. And I was floored. It was some of the most beautiful artwork that I've seen in any museum anywhere. The exhibit that is up currently, I think it's still up, um, is all quilts. And I'm going to put some pictures up here while I'm talking, but um, they were they were captivating the artistry in these these pieces and by the way by the way they they are from 150 to 200 years old to the present they are done by men and women in various parts of the country um who are not famous artists these are not you know installation pieces they were actual quilts that were meant to go on actual beds or you know used as heirlooms in some cases they were fundraisers for a church or for a community group um things of that nature and they explain that in their descriptions but um they were yeah th th these are just things that people like you and i made and then when i say you and i i am assuming you are not a major world famous artist yourself as I am not <laughs> so they are like you and I and that they are just people that created things in these quilts I mean 150 years ago I'm sure that they weren't thinking this is going to be in a museum one day and yet here it is and so worthy of it so stunningly beautiful and intricate and um, like I said some of the best art that I've seen and you know there are a lot of galleries you go into and you're like mm doesn't really do anything for me what are they thinking I don't know and then you think sometimes maybe it's just me maybe it's just above me I don't I don't get it um, but in this case I walked in and I'm sure any of you would too and just think no I do get it this is this is made for someone it's meant to keep a person warm protected it's probably made for someone or some some buddies that this this creator this maker loved cared for and it was done these all of the pieces are done with just so much um care and appreciation and i can't say enough good about it and um shame on me for again being snobbish in my um assessment of it prior to going to see it i am not proud of that um and i know too that there are lots of conversations online that i've seen about um you know the 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 value and the state and the, the, the well, the, the question itself, is it art? This shirt that I knit, is it art? Um, you know, that shawl that you made, is it art? And probably we would all say yes, but, um, you know, in the world at large, it's not always seen that way. And um, so to the degree that I participated in that mindset, I remove myself from it and I say to you go to the American Folk Art Museum it was really really something special and uh, you will not regret it also it's free also it's small you can probably see it all in really in an hour two tops but really an hour an hour and a half and it's right by the Lincoln Center so you should then walk across and go to the new um, lounge that's in the the Geffen Hall I think um, in the Lincoln Center uh, it's really cool they've got a coffee shop and a wine bar and you can get a drink and you can just sit and you can people watch and it's really really nice so um, okay where do we go next is it time for France yet or do I have anything else that I need to mention first um, <laughs> ah yes I suppose um, you know how when you watch videos like this and, and all of the, the content creators make a big deal about asking you to subscribe? Well, the reason they do that is because the more people that subscribe, the more the, the algorithm pushes things like this out there to the world. Um, so I feel like I should just mention that right now. I know a lot of you may have already subscribed, but if you've enjoyed these, these uh, episodes and this podcast, please share it with your friends. Let them know. And um, let's build the audience and have conversations because um, I've really enjoyed interacting with everybody and I would love to do it even more. So yeah, if you like it, subscribe and share and let the people know. 
okay? <laughs> now, France. So this trip, as I said, it was a food and wine tour. And um, I will be posting a lot of pictures kind of as I go um, and maybe some video clips too. Uh, I've, got, I've got so many and it's gonna take a long time to edit this. I'm gonna try to get it all done in a single day, but it might take a few. Um, so anyway, bear with me. Um, the itinerary for this trip, uh, it began in uh, Bordeaux and we worked our way east and north uh, through the Dordogne region, up through Burgundy, and then finally over to Paris. And um, it was quite an adventure. I was part of a tour group um, that included mostly um, other teachers and their partners and spouses. And um, we had a phenomenal time. It was a, it was a great group of people to travel with and um, just, yeah. The people were fun, and as you know, I'm sure if you've traveled in a group, that can make or break um, a, an experience, and in this case, it made it. They were all great, and um, if any of you are watching now, <laughs> it was a phenomenal time, and I'm so glad to have spent it with all of you. Um, we started in Bordeaux, and uh, for me, this was, was really, really exciting. As you probably know, you may have guessed, I do enjoy my wine. Um, but <laughs> uh, Bordeaux is one of my favorite regions to explore uh, in terms of just when I'm shopping for a bottle. That's one of the places that I look for, especially saint Emilion. And um, this trip, we, we went there. Uh, in fact, the two wine regions that we did in the Bordeaux area, the immediate area, uh, were in saint Emilion, And we visited the town itself, which is a small uh, sort of medieval village uh, that gives the region its name, and it is really, really something to see. Uh, there's a church there, it's called the Monolith Church, and it was built by a hermit, I think, the, I think Saint Emilion himself, uh, underground, and then a larger church was built on top of it. It's very, very stunning. We weren't able to go into the underground part, but uh, it dominates the landscape, and you can see it from everywhere, it's very cool. Um, Hold on. In the town of Bordeaux itself, uh, another place that I was really excited to see was the Cité du Vin, uh, which is the city of wine or the wine museum. And um, I've read about it for a couple of years now and, and didn't know when I would ever see it, if I would ever see it, but I did get to see it and it was really, really well done. Um, the, the way they move you through the exhibition is very interactive, very, very cool. And I highly recommend that if you're in the area. We um, spent a lot of time walking around, exploring the history, eating, etc. And um, then, actually, you know what, the, not then, the first thing that I did when I got there because we had some free time and I didn't know how much more free time I would have, I was like, let me just hit the yarn stores right away. So I did. And um, the, well, yarn store, I should say. I looked online. There are a few, um, but the one that caught my eye um, and, and the one that I went to is called La Lenerie. Uh, the Woolery uh, in English, but La Lenerie. And um, it is run by a very nice woman named Marie Lean. And uh, I went there and spent some time chatting with her. And she was um, just kind of telling me about the local situation with um, yarn shops, sellers, dyers, etc. And uh, they happen to have, hold on, let me find my bag of toys here. Is it this one? Yeah, it's this one. Um, she happens to work with somebody who's a dyer uh, who dyes yarns for her own shop. And uh, here's one of them. So you can see La Lenerie made unique. And um, yeah, I walked out with four skeins. Obviously, you can tell that I was thinking initially of something wine themed, but uh, then I got caught by this yellow, which I think is gorgeous. And I think the screen is picking up the colors pretty well right now, actually. That looks accurate. And finally, this guy, a green. So yeah, these are, I think they're 
100% Merino Superwash DK. And um, I'm, I picked them up not knowing what I wanted to do, but in the time that I've spent kind of looking at them and getting to know these yarns, I realized what I'm going to do with them is the Smurfette Scarf by David Van de Kamp of Van de Kamp Designs. And um, it calls for, I believe it calls for, uh, four DK colors, and it will blend these all together in lots of fun ways. But look at these. I, they're, they're very moody <laughs> and, uh, and very cool, like this yellow. You know, it's not just a plain yellow. You see the tints of brown. It's, it's not even tints because it's not speckled, but there's enough brown in it that it kind of like contains its own shadow, I think. So it's not a pure yellow. In fact, we'll get to this later, but like this is a bright little yellow. And this one is like, mm, you're too happy for me. And I need to express myself in a different way. And that's what's going on here with this yellow. Um, <laughs> in fact, all of these are. They are, they are, oh, they're angsty. That's what they are. And these are angsty colors. These two, they want to fight. Like, they are not happy with each other. Each one thinks it's the best one on the block or the best one in the glass. And uh, you're both wonderful. It's going to be great. We're going to have a fun time working together <laughs> and becoming a scarf. So yeah, uh, here they are again. And uh, once more, these are from La Lannerie. And there's the name again, so you can see it's spelled. And you should definitely um, give them a follow. I'll put a link down below. Um, and if you're in Bordeaux, you should go and visit. Uh, it's an independent local yarn shop. Really, really lovely. And like I say, um, the owner, Marie Lean, was very welcoming and fun to talk to. And um, yeah, so. Check her out, check out the store, uh, give them some love. All right, um, moving right along. Actually, now we're gonna stick in Bordeaux for just a minute. I just wanted to say to um, the, sh the vineyards uh, and, and winemakers that we visited were as follows. Chateau de Ferrand and Chateau de Candal. And just out of town a little bit as we were heading into the Dordogne region, um, Chateau de Montbaziac. And I got there a, um, a bag. You can kind of see what the chateau looked like a little bit and how it's spelled. They make these um, sweet white wines that are really to die for. They're really, really good. And our, um, our tour director, she explained to us that these are the starter wines that, that French children first drink because they are so sweet. But for me, never having um, that experience, I was like, wow. Um, they go down a little too easily, but they taste like, like sunshine and honey in a glass mixed together. It's really, really cool, really special. So check those out. Check If you get a chance to have a sweet white Bordeaux, don't pass it up. I myself tend to be more of a red person, but I was like, you know what? I need to try new things and uh, I'm here. So let's get all the things that I never really find when I'm shopping around locally here back in the States. And so um, I'm glad I did. <laughs> it was really great. Okay, where do we go from there? Um, oh no, my notes. What did I do with them? Here they are. Just so you see, we. These are my notes. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, okay. Ah, yes, a few more things that we did. Um, we went to the Bay of Arcachon, which is a little bit to the west, about an hour, and did a boat ride through there. We uh, went to an oyster tasting in the oyster capital of, the, of France. And um, we also, or I also, finished a pair of socks. So I think I may have shown you these the last time um, but I've, they're both done now. Ta -da, ta -da. Um, and I am calling these my Chaussette saint Emilion, My saint Emilion socks because I finished them in saint Emilion, And because, as I will show you in pictures here, um, I had the one finished and I kind of played around with it, uh, putting it on, in the vines and, and having some fun at the vineyards itself. As we're driving along, looking at the vineyards and the, the lines as they flash by the window, I was working on this, and the lines of the sock 
as I held it up to the window. They kind of lined up and matched. It was cool. Um, but obviously the greens and the purples, um, very suggestive of grapes and vines. And the white is the clouds. And um, yeah, I'm going to be writing this up. By the way, I did start to write up my previous pair of socks, the pattern. Um, it's The first one's very simple. This one's only slightly less simple. Um, but it does involve some some lacy bits, just the, the holes there. Let's see, I'm trying to frame myself perfectly. Um, <laughs> here we go. Everything's reversed. It's not mirrored, which is a little weird. Um, so as I was saying, yeah, uh, one sock, and I couldn't tell you which one right now. I'd have to look a little more closely. Uh, but one of them involves doing a yarn over and a slip slip knit, and the other one involves doing a knit two together yarn over. And that makes it so that the direction of the holes goes opposite, so that when you wear the socks, they will kind of complement each other and not be two of the exact same. Um, but the process of knitting them is, is one is not harder than the other. Um, and I am very, very pleased with the way that they've turned out. It's a lot of fun to make. So I had the first one finished before I went. Um, I finished the second one while on the plane and then also um, in the bus. And yeah, cast it off then. And then I immediately cast on the next one. But I'm going to get to that in just a moment because that's my burgundy sock. This is the Bordeaux sock, the Chaussette Saint-Emilion. Um, but yeah, this is Bordeaux. Burgundy's coming up. <laughs> OK. Um, next. Okay, I think I've um, covered everything I wanted to cover here. Oh, only to say that we were also in the area for Bastille Day, uh, July 14th, La 14 Juillet, uh, which is really cool. If you're ever in France at that time, um, have fun at the different firefighters' balls that happen. Um, in Bordeaux on the 13th, they had a huge, huge festival. Um, and it seemed like the entire city was there. All ages, like just everyone was present and having a really good time uh, celebrating. And there was a band and, and a DJ. It, it was wonderful. And then the next day, we were in the Dordogne region at um, the town of Perigueux. And I did not stay that night for the fireworks. A couple of people did, and they said they were magnificent. But um, in any case, it's, it's a lot of fun. You should definitely uh, put that on your bucket list if you haven't been, if you haven't experienced Bastille Day in France. So on to the Dordogne region. Um, as I said, uh, we visited the, the small city of Perigueux, which is very, very beautiful. Um, we were there on the Saturday when they had their Saturday market going. And um, it was just huge, huge. I mean, you know, we have farmers markets here in, in Hoboken, and you probably do wherever you're watching from if you're in the States. Um, but uh, this was on a massive scale, just a hundred vendors and, and um, the fruits, the strawberries, especially, oh my God, um, everything was so vibrant, so tasty. A lot of us spotted different things, shared them, and it was um, a fun experience getting to see all of that. Um, and then um, we stayed in a chateau. Uh, it was called, I don't know if I wrote this down, but it was a Chateau de Reyna, I believe. I'll correct myself later in the notes if I'm wrong, but that's what it was called. Um, and uh, in that area, that is where we also got to see Lascaux. And if you watched the previous episode, then you know that um, what I'm currently wearing right now is my Lascaux Henley. And uh, it's, is it a Henley tee? I don't know. I did this collar um, thinking it would kind of come together. And initially, I thought to myself I was going to put like a, a button panel, like a Henley tee. Um, but as I was working with it, I kind of, I didn't work with the pattern. I just sort of let the, the yarn express itself and uh, tell me what to do. And I got to this point and I was like, mm, I, don't, I don't think it needs it, actually. I just, I wanted it to kind of be open. Now, I will tell you, by the way, I'm going to tell you a lot more about this sweater. Sorry, it's not a It's a tee. It is a tee. Um, in, an, in the next episode, we're going to do an, this is episode 8A. I'm going to do an 8B. Uh, that goes more in depth on how to make this. Because a lot of people were asking me on Instagram um, how to do it, what the pattern is, and there is no pattern. I just 
lately I've been just making things um, and having fun, uh, playing with the yarns, and like I said, letting the yarn kind of tell me what to do once I get to a certain point, make a decision, and, and see what happens. Um, but, uh, but it's not hard to do, and if you know the basic skills of knitting and purling and increasing and decreasing and knitting in the round, then you can do this easily, even if you've never done a sweater before or a top before. Um, I will tell you how to do it in the next episode, so I'll go in, 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 into more depth about this, but just so you can kind of see the whole length of it. Um, I started down here with a one by one rib, which in the flax, by the way, uh, I talked about this in the previous episode, but the um, material is Fibra Natura flax, 100% flax. And I, I really do love it. I know I expressed in the last time um, my jury was out a little bit. I mean, I was enjoying it, but I didn't know if I loved it yet. Now I can tell you I loved it. I really like working with the flax. I like the way it, it feels silky and waxy, but not silk, but that's kind of the general feel. Um, doesn't have a lot of give when you're pulling on it, but this actually, you know, it stretches a bit. Of course, it, now look what I've done. Um, <laughs> and then it fixes itself like that too. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the pleasure of just working with the material was, um, was great. And I will definitely work with it again. Um, I'm, I want to play around with it some more. One thing that I had hoped to do with this as I was designing it. Uh, I took my Vogue Knitting Stitch Dictionary, which I think I showed you the last time, and I wanted to give, I wanted to begin with something lacy. I, I knew I wanted it to be kind of stockinette up through the top, but I wanted to begin with like leaves, lacy looking leaves at the bottom because I wanted it to kind of give the impression of a bed of leaves kind of decaying because in my head, I was, as I've told you, this is my Henley Lascaux. I made it for the Lasco experience, and um, I wanted it to have some symbolism to it. So just the idea of a bed of leaves, family tree, human history, leaves falling, kind of decaying, but still present, still there, and still causing growth, fertilizing the ground. All of that's what's going on in my head as I was imagining this. But as I tried to make those leaves happen, no. I'm really <laughs> admiring a lot of the lacier tops that I'm seeing this summer um, from men. Uh, and I really wanted to go that direction. But I don't have a whole lot of experience with lace and even reading the patterns in Vogue Knitting Stitch Dictionary. Um, I, I tried it so many times and I just, I, I don't tell, you all tell me about your experience, but I would, you know, I was just swatching trying to get it right. and. You know, I'd get the first two rows, and then I'd come back, and all of a sudden the count would be off. I'm like, where did I add or not subtract, or what, what happened? Why did this mess up? And I couldn't figure it out. So I, I really just eventually gave up because I was running out of time. I mean, I might have kept with it and figured it out eventually, but I had a deadline because I wanted this done by the time I left for the trip. So I just decided, again, to do the one-by-one -one rib. But the way that it looks here, there we go, um, it's a little well, frankly, a little primitive. <laughs> um, it doesn't have the sort of bounce that a yarn, um, or sorry, not yarn, a wool yarn would have. Um, but I decided that I liked that and stuck with it. And I've also kept it for the sleeves. And uh, yeah, I'm very pleased with it. And then the, um, the neck, what I did here is, so the, where it divides, I um, obviously, if you're working in the round, you get to this part, and then you've got to start working flat back and forth. Um, and so I, gosh, I'm sorry. I keep looking at the screen and trying to do things in the reverse of what I'm seeing. Maybe I should just focus on myself and not look at the screen. So here <laughs> on the, the neckline, uh, I, I skipped a stitch at the start when I was going back and forth. And uh, that left some, you know, a nice little edge there. And then when I cast off, um, I went back to my Stephen West shawl making roots and I did the um, I cord bind off. So I don't know how well you can see that here, but that's what I did. And as I did it, I wanted, I knew that if I started here and worked around and came here, that the two ends might be a little off 
because where you start the I chord and where you end the I chord, they don't always look the same. So um, what I did was I started in the back of the neck in the middle, and then I worked this way, and then I went back and used a new strand, and I worked that way so that they would match each other. And then I, there was a very, very long tail still, and I had intended um, to just kind of leave it hanging a little bit or leave like some string here just to play with or just to have dangling, just, you know, whatever. Um, I saw it was in a episode of Fruity Knitting that um, I can't remember the name of the artist or the designer that um, she was uh, interviewing, but one of the, several of the pieces that this designer had made left things that looked intentionally unfinished and uh, it was kind of cool. So I thought about doing that myself, but when I was, or I should say after I did the I chord bind off, it pulled things a little tighter and it changed the way that this was draping and laying. And so um, I, I, I wanted the look that I have currently, but it was a little more, and it wasn't even equal, <laughs> it wasn't symmetrical. So I had those long tails. I still have the long tails. You know what I did with them? I just put it on a thread, pulled it through, and actually, um, let's see if I can even straighten this out. Yeah, see, I can go in there, and if these get a little unruly, just pull the string <laughs> and pull it flat again. Maybe I'll tie it down. I don't know. I haven't yet. But um, that's, that's my little trick, and uh, I like the effect. I really do. I like the sort of the, the lighthearted curve. It's like a raised eyebrow, and... Uh, I just think it gives a nice shaping to it, actually. So very, very pleased with this. And uh, I will, as I said, do another brief video on how to make it more fully. Oh, so I told you this in the last episode. Um, my vision for this piece was that it would have emblazoned upon it some of the images from the Lascaux Caves, possibly an aurochs or a great big bull, something of that nature. And as you can see, it does not have that, but I did try. <laughs> and, um, well, first let me say that I've never done any embroidery. I've never done any needlepoint. I haven't really even done a whole lot of sewing other than just seeming knitted pieces together. But I tried. I was like, how will I figure this out? And I think I mentioned um, in the previous episode that I was intending to go to a local yarn shop in the West Village that specializes in needlepoint, but I didn't have the time and didn't, it just didn't happen. So I thought, well, you know what? Let me think like the cave painters of Lascaux and be innovative and creative of my own ability. So I thought, you know, I can figure this out. And so what I came up with was to create a stencil of the aurochs and I used a lid from um, like a takeout container. You know how you acquire them over the years and then all of a sudden you have a stack of containers and somehow, does this happen to you? Like you end up having more lids than containers. Like how does that happen? Where do they go? If you're gonna throw one away or recycle it, then you usually get rid of both top and bottom. I don't know, but we have so many tops and not enough containers. So I used one of the tops. I laid it over an image of the aurochs. I traced it. I cut it out. I placed it on here. I even used my ring light, which is right behind the screen here, put it down <laughs> and mounted the, the, the top over that so that I could have the little, you know, frame. I don't know what you call that um, because I don't know how to embroider. But um, I, I, I've seen it, I've seen people do it, so I thought, you know, I need a space that's gonna pull it tight and let me move. Well, with the stencil, I quickly realized, eh, it doesn't really stay in place. What can I do to like get the shape? I got a pencil, I was like, if I go lightly on it, will it leave a mark that I can later erase? No, it didn't leave a mark. Then I thought, hmm, what about chalk? Only I don't have any chalk. So then I thought, what about flour? and I used some flour and I sprinkled it over the stencil. <laughs> and so then I removed the stencil and I had this flowered Orox on my top. And that worked okay for a minute, 
but then it kind of like just quickly disintegrated and melted away. So back to the drawing board. You know what I finally did? I got some cotton balls, and then I thought to myself, maybe this will work kind of like needle felting, like I pulled the cotton really, really thin, and then I used a needle and I kind of tapped it into the shape that I wanted on, on the shirt, and then I started to needle point around it. And it worked, that worked, actually for a while until it didn't. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to put up pictures here. I'll put them up now, now that I've explained the whole process, so you can see what I finally came up with, my embarrassing little Aurochs, which compared to what, you know, our, our ancient ancestors were able to do 20,000 years ago, they did a lot better than I did. And um, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, needless to say, because you can see, I didn't leave it on. I, I took all of that out and said, screw it. It's going like this. And you know what? It was better that way. It's better this way. Just plain, simple, and um, still an homage to our, our ancients. And um, by the way, if you have the opportunity to ever do so, please go to Lesco. It's so cool. It's so cool. Um, one of the things that fascinated me about it, first of all, I guess I should say up front, you can't actually go to the real caves because they opened them up to the, the public in the 60s, or maybe they closed it down in the 60s. They were open in the 50s. But over time, um, with so many people going through them and the, the the breathing and the, the just the change of temperature from the presence of so many humans in that spot, um, it started to affect the quality of the painting. So they quickly realized, nope, we can't have people in here anymore. So what they did um, today, what you see now, is you walk into this recreation, and I don't mean like a picture of somebody drawing the same image on a wall. No, I mean, you think you're in the real thing. They've recreated the whole cave three-dimensionally, so you walk into it, they, they adjust, you first go into a room where they, it's very dark, so they allow your eyes to adjust. When you get into the space, everything's temperature controlled, so you feel like you're in the cave. Like you really, if you didn't know that it was fake, you wouldn't know that it was fake. Um, and uh, I happened to buy one of their, their books at the gift shop, and the author was there, and he, I spoke to him, he told me that he'd been into the real ones um, five or six times, and he could attest that the copy that they've made is, he said, it's almost 100% um, accurate and really, really cool. So knowing that going in, um, the other thing that made it so incredible was um, just learning that, okay, so the people making these things, they're using tiny little lamps and uh, you know working their ways into very small parts of the cavern and um, but it was meant to be seen by lamplight. And the guide pointed out that, he, she said, you know, these things aren't completely random. If you look at how the, the animals are painted, the painters used the natural features of the cave to position certain body parts. So where there's an angular bend in the, the rock, there is an angular bend to the, say, horse's leg or the horse's body so that if you were to go in there today with lamplight and flickering flame the shadows the way that it's cast it causes a sensation of movement so for the people going in 20,000 years ago they would experience the sensation of these animals moving because of the way that the shadows move I was blown away that was so so cool to me um, the caves were already cool. I went into this, you know, my, my expectations were so high, my excitement level was so high, I had only to be let down. And I wasn't. It was, um, it was even better than I anticipated. So I really, really do encourage you to go there to see it. Um, you will leave with, with an expanded understanding of um, human ingenuity. You know, I think about, I, I wrote this actually in a post, you may have seen it, um, we, we think about that people of that time period, the Ice Age, you know, caveman, hit woman on head with club, pull her by hair, you know, that kind of thing. Things from cartoons and stereotypes and whatnot. Um, and to see this, you just quickly realize, oh my God, that's so 
not it. That's so not accurate at all. Um, these were people who were way more advanced than we give them credit for. And um, I think it's worth reconsidering the human story and the role that all of us play in it. So that was really, really special to me. And I think you should go see it. <laughs> Book your flight today. Okay, um, so that's the Lasco Henley. That's the Lasco experience. And now we move on to... Do we move on or am I wrong? Hold on. Ah, yes. So our um, trip then started to move into Burgundy, but we had to pass through a few other areas to get there. We went through, through the Auvergne region of France. And with that, we stopped at a cheese farm. It was called um, Ferme La Roche in a small town of Orcival uh, on a mountaintop. And uh, in this place, uh, in this region, it's where they make Saint, 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 Saint Nectaire cheese. <laughs> and so we got to, to experience the cheese that's made on this farm on the mountaintop. Really, really cool, really, really special. Um, and then not long after that, we were in Burgundy, Bourgogne. And um, there, I was really, really moved by a couple of things. Um, so you may know this, uh, you may not know this, uh, I guess it depends on if you are a wine connoisseur, but um, in European wines, uh, the wines are named after the places. So um, a Bourgogne or Burgundy, as we would say, um, is if it's a red, it's going to be made with a Pinot Noir grape, or if it's white, it's going to be made with Chardonnay. And there are some exceptions and there's some other things that are mixed in, but a Burgundy has to include those, whereas a Bordeaux has to include Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and then from there, those grapes are combined and they are, are bottled and named for the, the towns and the regions where they're from. So going into these places like, like Burgundy, um, I, I've known about a lot of the places and it was fun to visit, for example, Meursault and have a glass of Meursault in Meursault and so on. And then I also got to visit, we visited some of the towns that um, I wasn't as familiar with and got to try the wines from there. Uh, one of the, actually two of the, the vineyards that we visited were um, Comte Senar, and that was in the Alox Corton. No, I think I'm saying that wrong. Alox Croton, Corton, Corton, Alox Corton <laughs> uh, town, village, appellation. And that was one uh, we also visited. Where is it? Here, this bag. Chateau de Chamaret, which was in the um, Mercury region or town. And um, they were both wonderful, really, really cool. The, the area is so peaceful and, and, you know, not particularly, it's hilly, but not mountainous. Um, not flat, but just gentle. Beautiful, beautiful countryside, rolling landscape. And that actually um, unintentionally inspired the next work in progress that I want to show you, which is this sock. <laughs> As I said, it's unfinished. Um, so uh, you may be thinking to yourself, what's so burgundy about this sock? It's not a burgundy color. I mean, this place actually has a color that's named after it. So why have I not used that color? And the reason is, well, one practicality. Um, this is leftovers from the shawl that I made for Tori Amos. And um, this is the yarn from Woolen Women Fibers. Um, and this particular color is one that I did not really use in the shawl. So I had a lot of it left over. This blue I used a ton of, which is why it's only doing the accent work here. But um, in any case, it's a uh, merino cashmere blend. And it's going to feel great on the feet. But what I, I didn't really intend to call it anything to do with burgundy because initially I didn't think of it that way. But as we were on the bus moving through the countryside, I began to just, as I'm you know, knitting, and then I look out and I'm like, oh, the, the, there's fields of like, you know, this colored wheat and, and, and hay that's spread out. And then these hay bales that kind of, you know, have this gentle, um, cylindrical shape, which is suggested or, or began to sort of reflect in my imagination um, the way that these diagonals are working. So this, as you can see, I'm kind of in a diagonal spirally 
um, phase with my socks. They've all incorporated this in some way. However, this time I didn't use any lacy holes. This is all done with um, yarn over in the front and just being mindful of where I'm placing the yarn. That's the wrong word, not yarn over. <laughs> I'm slipping with the yarn in front and then creating that little hashtag, M dash, I don't know, a line of yarn, which when you do it strategically and calculatingly, um, you get these beautiful effects. You see that? It almost looks to me like like a scar, like if you've had a deep cut and then the skin scars at first and you have a little bit of a raised element. I know that doesn't sound romantic or poetic or even anything to do with burgundy, but um, that's kind of how it looks. But it also, as I said, it started to suggest the fields and same with the um, way that the lines of the previous sock lined up with the lines of the vineyards. This also had that, that effect. So I came to realize, oh, you know what? This is very burgundy, actually. Burgundy the place, not burgundy the color. Uh, and not burgundy the wine, but the place itself has a lot of this. And um, I will, if I haven't already done so at this point in the video, I will put up some pictures um, so that you can see that for yourself. But that's what was inspiring this. Um, this I will write up eventually too, um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's fun. It's cute, isn't it? But I've put it down for a moment because I have something else that I'm working on right now that is even, well, more directly inspired by um, Burgundy the Place and the colors that I saw. One moment, I'm going to take a sip of pomegranate juice. I swear it's pomegranate juice. Okay. Um, so, uh, we one of the, the, I guess the biggest... Well, the biggest city in the region is Dijon, um, where the mustard comes from. Although, actually, what we learned from going to the mustard factory, uh, the, the mout Moutarderie de Fallot, the Famille fam Fallot, um, the Fallot family mustardery. <laughs> we don't have that word in English, do we? Mustard factory. Um, we uh, visited there, and we learned that unlike wines and unlike cheeses, other people started using the name Dijon and applying it to mustard. So if you have a Dijon mustard, it doesn't necessarily come from Dijon. Whereas if you have a Meursault wine, it comes from Meursault. There's laws, actual laws about that. Um, but anyway, neither here nor there. <coughs> so uh, Dijon is the biggest city, but um, sort of the center of, of at least the northern part of Burgundy, the Côte d'Or. Um, the, the major city center there is the um, small city of Beaune. And um, in Beaune, there is a place that's called the Hôtel Dieu, the Hotel of God, God Hotel, um, it, which is uh, run by or part of the Hospice de Beaune, so the, the hospital system, going back into the Middle Ages. I think it was started um, kind of late Middle Ages in the 1400s. But anyway, um, I bought this bag there, and I'm going to show it to you because this is the tiling on the rooftop of the um, Hotel Dieu, and I loved it. I mean, if, if you are a knitter, you probably look at this and instantly see a pattern, right? Something that you could easily turn into a piece of knitwear, and that is certainly what I saw, and I have big dreams of, of working more with this, and I took lots of pictures of all the different sections of the rooftop. Um, and at first, it was just something I associated with Bone in the Auspice, um, the Auspice de Bone, Hotel Dieu. But uh, as we went to different other places, in fact, I think it was in, it was in the town of Merceau, uh, the city hall there had a very, very similar roof, which I'm going to show you now. And so, then I realized as we're going to the different towns, like this tiling and this, this aesthetic and these colors are very, very prevalent in the region. And so when I got to Paris eventually, um, I, there is a, a cute yarn shop in Dijon, but my timing didn't line up. I wasn't able to get there while it was open. So I didn't buy anything yarn wise in Dijon, but I did in Paris, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but I will show you now this or these three, hold on. 
So uh, remember those colors? Um, here, they're a little muted in the bag, and here they're much brighter, but if you look at the picture of the rooftop from, um, from Merceau, uh, these are pretty close, pretty, maybe not exact, but pretty close. And anyway, so I wanted to play around with these, and I wanted to return to the idea of the lacy top that I um, had wanted this shirt to be. By the way, you know, I, it is a little bit lacy. I mean, you can see, get little glimpses <laughs> underneath the surface here where there are some holes. But um, anyway, I uh, started to work with these. I wanted something that suggested that roof pattern. Not exactly, I wasn't going exact, but um, I wanted to, hold on here, just getting this straightened out. Here we go. Yeah, this is what this is looking like so far. So it's going to be a top. I don't know if it's going to be, I had in mind a tank top actually, um, but as I'm working with it, I'm thinking it might want to be structured kind of like this shirt. Um, but in any case, yeah, let me get this a little closer for you. It's cool, right? Um, so I'm just striping this uh, every three rows, which is why you can see ends coming off on either end here uh, because it goes one, two, three, start the new color, one, two, three, start the new color, <laughs> back and forth like that. Um, but uh, yeah, this will be the front piece of either the tank top or the top, and it will be very cool, very, very um, pleasant to wear and work with, I think. And this is 100% cotton. It is, uh, where'd it go? Sheepjes, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I'm guessing it's Dutch from the way that, yeah, it looks like Dutch. Um, Sheepjes, but uh, Katona, and it is 100% mercerized cotton. I don't know what it means to be mercerized, but I'm sure it's fun. Um, so, yeah, the, the other thing, as I after I already started working on this, I also began to realize, oh, you know what? As we were driving through the region, um, we passed by so many sunflower fields. And in fact, we stopped, our bus stopped at one place so we could all go out and get in the sunflower fields and, and uh, take our pictures there. So uh, I, I, I did, and I happened to be wearing a dark brown shirt that day. And now as I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, that picture, that memory, also connects with this image. So it's not just the rooftops, it's the sunflower fields, and it is um, bus rides and, and, and warm weather and good wine and great friends and all sorts of memories that are going to be encapsulated in this piece that I'm going to think of every time I wear it. So I'm very excited about that. Um, the shop that I went to was Lil Weasel, um, which if you remember back in Bordeaux, La Lenerie, uh, Marie Lean, who runs it, she suggested that I go there, and so I did once we got to Paris. So let me tell you about Paris. Um, where are my notes at? Okay. In Paris, um, no, I'm just checking. I did say everything I wanted to say about Burgundy. Um, in Paris. So, uh, been to Paris several times. Um, I've seen most of the things that you see when you do a tourist trail through the city. Um, so more often when I go back now, I like to just take it easy and um, sit in the Jardin de Tuileries and watch people and knit or, you know, have a drink and relax. It's, I, I don't feel like I have to do a whole lot while I'm there. Um, but the one thing that I've never ever seen and I've wanted to see forever was Saint Chapelle. And if you have been there, then you already know that it's like one of the most ridiculously beautiful spots on the planet. Um, and uh, anyway, I was, I, it finally happened. We were finally there and um, I was just blown away. I don't even have a knitting project in mind to encapsulate that experience because it was so much color, so much light, so much history, so much just, oh, and, um, yeah, all I have really right now are the pictures. Maybe one day I will be enough of a 
a knitting artist that I could capture something of that in work. But um, yeah, now it's too big for me and just too impressive. And anyway, uh, I highly recommend that you go to visit Saint Chapelle if you have not already done so. And even if you have, go do it again because I know I will go back. It was really, really something special to see. Um, we did a macaron class. I learned how to make macarons. And uh, not as complicated as I thought. Not easy, but not as complicated as I thought. Um, also went to the Altani collection, which is in the um, Hotel de la Marine, which is right by um, the Place de la Concorde, where the obelisk is, where the guillotine was. Um, and uh, there is a art collection that's in there. It's very s relatively small, three rooms. Um, two of the rooms are the permanent collection, and this man, Monsieur Altani, um, I want to say he was Iranian, but I could be completely wrong about that. Uh, but in any case, his, his art collection of, of ancient pieces from around the world um, is presented here in the, this Hotel de la Marine. Um, and the third room featured uh, um, English medieval works and the exhibition uh, was titled, this is what made me go to it, I thought it was really funny, it was called When the English Spoke French. <laughs> kind of a little <laughs> um, on the part of the curators of this, uh, towards the English, I suppose. But um, in any case, very, very cool to see these medieval works in a small space. Because, you know, when you go to the Louvre or um, here in New York to the Cloisters Museum that features medieval art, um, there's so much of it, and you just can get overwhelmed by the sheer number. This hat was one room, very like carefully selected pieces, most of them coming from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And um, so it, it was, they were just able to tell a story that was easier to grasp in a smaller amount of time. And for that reason, felt a little, um, a little richer uh, than just bathing in seas of, you know, huge amounts of art the way you do at the Louvre, which is its own experience. And that's cool too. Um, to be overwhelmed that way. But uh, I liked this. I thought it was really, really nice. Uh, okay, so there's more to tell you about yarn. Um, at Little Weasel, um, I did not know this because I'd never been there before. It, it has two parts to the shop. You walk down uh, this passageway, covered passageway with a bunch of other shops, and I saw the sign for the place, and so I went to the right, and I went in, and I found the yarns that I showed you, which are the ones that I'm using for the burgundy piece, the yellow, the green, and the brown. But then I walked out after buying them, and by the way, they were fairly cheap. I was like, oh, I just walked out of here with nine skeins, nine little balls of yarn, um, and I think each one cost not more than three euros. And uh, so that was, I felt very proud of myself. And then I walked out and I saw, oh, wait, there's a second half to this store. And I walked in and I was like, okay, well, I already bought some things, but let me go. And then something caught my eye. And it was here. These two beauties um, from La Bien Aimée. And these were not three euros a piece. Um, but uh, there, it's the first time that I've ever purchased La Bien Aimée. I've obviously heard lots about it. Um, they have a wonderful presence online and um, people seem to really love working with these yarns. So I was very excited to find these and I love these colors. I mean, just look at that. Isn't that pretty? And they didn't really connect thematically with anything that I uh, have experienced. Because by the way, I should also say, I did come to France on a wine tour expecting that I would buy lots of wine colored yarn and make something that would be wineish, whiny, um, wine-esque. But I didn't really buy much that was that color. Uh, I found lots of other things though. And then um, as I was walking through the hotel in our final hotel, um, I noticed on the wall the artwork and the, the, the wall itself, which was gray, and the artwork, which was all this mustardy color, 
I was like, oh, these colors are everywhere on this floor. So now it does connect with my Paris portion of the trip. And, um, you know, not that it has to. Nice yarn is nice yarn. Great colors are great colors. They do not have to connect to anything at all. But um, since they're souvenirs from a very memorable experience, I would like them to. And now they do. So um, I'm going to do with this something similar to what I'm doing with the other ones. Something lacy. But when I say lacy, I mean like I could go to a restaurant in it. <laughs> Not so lacy, but just you know, a pattern with some holes in it that looks, uh, looks like I'm dressed, if that makes sense. Um, not in a various state of undress. Anyway, um, that's that. And I will keep you posted with these. Looking forward to working with it, but not until I'm done with the other one. And that may be getting us very close to the end. Um, Oh, yeah, two more things. Uh, a trip to uh, Paris for me is never complete without strolling through Montmartre, and I got to do that on the second to last day, the last full day. Yeah, so I was in Montmartre. Uh, there are a couple of reasons I like going up there. Um, one is the history, and uh, I'm going to suggest a book. I should have had this ready to go. Let me go grab it off of the bookshelves right now. In Montmartre, Picasso, Matisse, and the Birth of Modernist Art by Sue Rowe. Um, this is a fantastic book. Um, it is a really, really interesting art history about the late 1800s, early 1910s, uh, and I really, I guess up to the 20s, if, as I recall. It's been a few years. It's been about six or seven years since I've read it. But um, you, you, get, you get Picasso, you get Modigliani, you get Matisse, you get... Gertrude Stein, and then also some of the writers like Hemingway and Fitzgerald, they make an appearance too. And just the, the idea of that place at that time and those minds and those creative forces coming together. And when you think of like all of the artistic output that came from that and the way that it inspired uh, people in it from painting and, and sculpture, but also into movies, into music, and, and you know, the birth of modernism, um, really, really cool um, to think about how that place was a nexus for that and kind of like caught the zeitgeist, shaped it, and gave it back out to the world. Um, yeah, read it. Once again, In Montmartre by Sue Rowe. Uh, she has another one too, In Montparnasse, which is about, a, you know, a little bit later into the 30s and 40s. I have not read the whole thing of that yet. I think I started to and I got distracted by something and I may not have finished it. But this one I loved and I do highly recommend it. Um, the other reason that I love going to Montmartre is, um, well, because of everything that's happened in the last few years, um, it's taken on a new level of significance for me. I was in Paris in 2020, in February, right before COVID. And um, when I was there at that time period, um, I have a niece who has a heart condition and um, I don't want to go too deeply into the the personal details, but um, as a baby, I mean, she's a toddler now, but uh, as a baby, uh, it was very touch or go, like how things were, were going to, to be for her. And in 2020, she needed to have a heart transplant and um, at, the, at a very young age. And so I was there with my grandmother and we both went to Sacré-Cœur, which uh, you may know is the church on top of the hill, which is visible throughout Paris, is very, very stunning and, and beautiful, but Sacré-Cœur means sacred heart, and um, so just, you know, sort of went there, prayed, and, um, you know, asked for the best for this loved one of ours, and as it turns out, everything went fine. Uh, she's doing very well. She had the transplant, and um, she's thriving today. So going back then in 2022, uh, which was the first time that I traveled after the lockdown portion of the last couple of years when we could travel again. Uh, it was also the first place that I happened to be back. So Paris bookended my, my lockdown time, uh, pandemic time. And uh, so then to go back there, 
again and just to be able to say, oh, here, here we are. We've been through a lot, haven't we? Um, again, to, to think of my niece, but also to think about the world and, and everything else that's happened and um, just to give thanks and be grateful. Um, for me now, it's become a place that's just a touchstone. Like if I'm in Paris, I have to go there. And so I made sure to get there again uh, on this trip. Um, I probably should do a Montmartre piece or a uh, Sacre Coeur knitted something that, that captures the feeling and the theme and the mood. But anyway, this got heavy all of a sudden. Let me lighten it up a bit by uh, finishing this off and saying that um, we happened to be there accidentally. Uh, on the last day that I was there, it was also the last day of the Tour de France. And um, I didn't know. I guess I should have known, but I, I didn't know what a very big deal this is. And um, I, uh, uh, w we got to see it and got to see the, the riders coming in through the city. And um, for those who don't know, as I did not know, um, the, when the riders come into Paris, they go down the Rue de Rivoli, along the Jardin de Tuileries, and then up the Champs Elysees and around and they do eight laps of that. And that's a pretty long stretch. If any of us were walking it, it would take, you know, an hour or two to do a lap. And they are going so fast. I'm gonna end by showing you the, the video of it. But um, yeah, the, so just seeing the, the, the excitement of the people as the riders come by, and, and I mean, they're gone in the blink of an eye. And then they're back in just minutes. I mean, they're going so fast through this, this whole space. And uh, anyway, it was very, very cool. Um, it was a beautiful way, really exciting way to end a trip that itself was very exciting and very fun, enriching, enlightening, mind-blowing, mind-expanding, artistically inspiring, um, all of that. I, I've, I've left with so much and I'm very, very grateful for the experience. And I am very excited to have been able to share this with you. And I hope that um, you also are having some wonderful experiences this summer that are giving you some life and some inspiration and um, you know, shaping the way that you are thinking about the things you're making. And um, please tell me below what those things are and uh, what, what has been something for you recently that has, has really, I don't know, uh, given some direction to something that you're working on or moved you. What has moved you? All right. Um, that is it for now. That's episode eight, everybody. I will, uh, as I said, I will get to the how to smaller video of how to make this shirt uh, shortly. And also, my grandmother is coming to visit me and she's going to be here tomorrow and she's staying for about 10 days so she and i have some plans to go up and down the east coast a little bit so uh may if you follow me online on instagram you may see some pictures from that uh, but i'm also considering if she's willing to do it uh, we might do a just film an episode of us talking because she also knits and she's done it her whole life and i mean you know most of it and um I've never even really sat to, to, I don't know, ask her about the origins of, of knitting or what it means for her. So I think it'd be fun to interview her and uh, just chat, chit chat as we knit. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I look forward to that if, again, she allows me to do it. Um, but hopefully she will. All right, everybody. See you next time. Be well. <laughs>